I walk down a long corridor of empty storefronts next to Mr. Jenkins, the fat man who sweated through his polyester blazer. He smoked a cigar, indoors. That's probably illegal, and I thought maybe he was testing me. I was there to take the job as the overnight security guard for his dying mall. Was he testing me? See if I had the moral courage to call out a man in power for violating the rules of this space? No, I decided. He didn't give a crap anymore. All of the stores closing and here he was having to hire an overnight security guard to stand sentry for a bunch of unprofitable space. Almost a million square feet of retail space, he said. Eight full corridors, three with second levels. Beautiful statues and fountains designed by an incredible artist. A food court and three major department stores. He stopped talking, waiting for some input from me. Impressive, I said. Yeah, he said. Used to be. So, uh, what's the need for an overnight guard? I asked. Has there been an uptick in crime? Worse, he said. Freaking YouTubers. Um, I'm sorry? I said. You know, it's this website where you post videos. Yeah, I know what YouTube is, I said. I'm 24 and I'm not Amish. I mean, what are they doing in the mall? They've been breaking in at night filming their videos. Skateboarding, pranking, ghost hunting, he said. Um, is the place haunted? I asked. He stopped, looked me right in the eyes. Son, malls are like hospitals or colleges. Big public areas. There's not one in the country that doesn't have at least one ghost story attached to it. Doesn't mean they're true. He took a puff of his cigar. Are you a YouTuber, Brian? No, I said. Job's yours if you want it. The first few shifts were pretty easy. I'm a night owl, and it's why I applied for the job in the first place. That said, I didn't know what else to do with my recently acquired BA in philosophy. I'm pretty sure Socrates was an overnight security guard until Plato started writing down everything he said. So who knows, maybe lightning could strike twice. I'd start my night by doing a full lap around the corridors, ride up and down the escalators, go through the employee-only hallways that house a few storage rooms for the stores. They're mostly empty since the mall itself is devoid of stores. It's really weird to think that all the empty storefronts I'd walk past, they all used to be places that people would flock to, weekly if not daily. I guess internet shopping got rid of all that. Anyway, the whole night I'd blast music from my phone through the mall's loudspeaker system. It wasn't a bad gig. On the fourth night, I left my phone at the central kiosk, playing a mix of 80s pop while I wandered around. It was a little after 3 a.m. by that point. At the ends of all the corridors were these fountains with faceless metal statues. They held each other's hands and danced in a circle around the fountain. All of the corridors had some variation of these same statues in almost identical poses. I was on the second floor, overlooking a fountain. Each head looked to the left of the next statue. I'm sure of it. I'd seen the statue dozens of times by this point, but I leaned over the rail. One of the statues looked up at me. I jumped back. I couldn't have seen what I thought I did, or maybe I just never noticed that one of the statues happened to just be looking upwards. I leaned back over the rail. The statue now looked to the left of the next statue, as they all did. I avoided the end of that corridor the rest of the night. The next night, I came in early while the remaining shops were still open. I figured I'd grab some dinner in the food court, walk around the mall in a less creepy context, and maybe ask some of the other employees if they ever saw anything weird. I'd had a slice of pizza at Sabaro when I saw her. Goth yogurt girl. Yeah, that's probably not her name, 
but that's what I called her in my head. She had long black hair, black eyeshadow and nail polish, and pale skin, but she wore this pastel, girly yogurt uniform that completely clashed with her personal aesthetic. I wasn't hungry, but I decided to get some yogurt. Large shake, please, I said. What flavor, she said. Could you swirl the cocoa crazy chocolate and the salivating strange strawberry together for me? I like it, she said, and then got to work on my order. I'm Brian, I said. I'm the new security guy. Yeah, I kind of figured that from the uniform, she said. How long have you worked here? I asked. Well, I finished my associates a little over a year ago, and then bought this place. Wait, you own the yogurt shop? <laughs> yeah, she said. The old owner wanted out since the mall's not doing so hot. I got it for a song. Figured it was cheaper than finishing my four-year degree. Why don't you make it all goth-themed then? Sorry if that's rude to ask, it's just... No, I get it, she said, and then handed me my shake. That's like my thing. She gestured at her makeup. I get it. If the place were all goth, people would assume that I only had black yogurt or something. But if I'm the pretty yogurt princess, then customers know I have all sorts of fruity and fun flavors. I sucked up some of the chocolate strawberry yogurt. This is amazing, I said. I handed her the cash. So, uh, hey, can I ask you something? Yeah, I'm one step ahead of you, she said with a smile. She was writing something on my receipt. Uh, what? I said. I was going to ask if you ever saw anything weird in the mall. Anything spooky, you know. You know, like, creeped you out. She then stopped writing and her eyes narrowed. Who told you to ask me that? She asked. Leave me alone. I'm sick of getting made fun of around here. She tossed my change and receipt to me and stormed off to her back room. I walked away and looked at the receipt. She was giving me her number before I pissed her off. Well, crap. That night, I made every excuse not to walk down to the end of the corridor that spooked me. There's a CCTV system, but Jenkins had mentioned that it kept breaking and he got tired of constantly getting it repaired. I spent a good part of the night just fiddling with it trying to get it working again. No such luck. I spent some time on YouTube looking for these videos that featured the mall. I found several by a skateboarder ripping down the hallways and through empty stores. In one of the videos, Jenkins actually sees him and tries to chase him for like five feet before he gives up, puffing out cigar smoke as he doubles over. There were a handful of prank videos too, almost all of which involved a teenage boy pushing another teenage boy into one of the fountains. Oddly, I couldn't find any ghost hunting videos, or anything creepy for that matter. A little after midnight, I stared into a pillar with a reflective surface. It distorted my shape like a funhouse mirror. Blue Monday was playing over the loudspeakers. 80s music just felt really appropriate for them all so I kept playing the same mix of songs. Through the reflection, I saw something shining behind me. Around the nearest corner was a faceless metal statue. Its head poked around an empty corner store, its hands clutching the edge of the wall barely in sight. None of the statues were positioned like that anywhere, and they were all at the ends of the corridors near the fountains. Not here. I sprinted down the hallway from the statue to the nearest exit. Blue Monday was still playing. The chain gate was locked shut in front of the doors. I fumbled with the keys. As I did, I turned back. The statue was at the end of the hall, out in the open. One arm reached out to me. I stopped searching for the gate key. YouTubers, I thought. They're the reason I got hired here in the first place. What if this is some elaborate video prank? Scare the security guard. I might end up in a viral video looking like the biggest coward. I put my keys back and took deliberate steps towards the statue. Hey. 
the mall's closed, I said in an octave lower than my normal voice. You're not supposed to be in here. I straightened my back. The statue didn't move. I don't know what got into me. Adrenaline, I guess. But I just sprinted at it. You're trespassing, I said. The statue was motionless. All right, I thought. You want to play chicken? I can play chicken if you want. I leapt to tackle the statue. My body thudded against the hard metal torso, then the back of my head slammed into the tile floor. As I lied there dizzy, then the statue moved. It bent over my body and then tilted its head like a dog. I passed out. I woke up in a hospital bed. A doctor told me that I was really lucky that I hadn't slipped into a coma. A guy I'd never met before came into my room wearing my uniform. He was barely 30. I looked down at myself and I saw I was in a hospital gown. Did you steal my uniform? I asked. What? He said. No, this is my uniform. I'm Jorge. I'm one of the day guards. Oh, I said. Sorry, got a minor concussion. I found you when I opened the mall. What happened? I told him about the statue. How it followed me. That I thought maybe it was a YouTuber. He handed me my phone. I'd left it at the central kiosk playing music. All right, he said. I'm going to call Mr. Jenkins. Let him know you tackled a YouTuber in the line of duty. But I don't think... Jorge then cut me off. I'm just going to tell him what he wants to hear. Don't let his cheap suit and dime store cigars fool you. This guy's loaded. If he thinks you took down a YouTuber last night, he'll cover your hospital bills. Hell, probably even give you a raise. I'll be back in a minute. I want to talk to you about something. Jorge stepped into the hallway to call Mr. Jenkins. While he was out there, I decided to Google the name of the mall in ghost hunting. I'd looked it up on YouTube before and found nothing, but searching the wider internet yielded a different result. On some probably malware riddled website, there was a copy of an old YouTube video that had been taken down. A college age girl addressed her viewers from inside her car. She said her name was Amanda. She planned to hide in a restroom before closing. That way she could stay in overnight and ghost hunt. She held up an audio recorder and a night vision camera. I skipped ahead. She sat in a bathroom stall. She sat quietly but just kept jerking every time she heard the slightest sound. What's that? She whispered. Who's there? It was another creaking sound. I jumped ahead towards the end of the video. She ran and screamed. All the doors are gone. All the doors are gone. I don't know how to get out. What's happening here? A guy was with her now. At least, I think it was a guy. The face never came into view. There was a really strange ambient sound in the video too. I can't tell you what it was. Jorge came back in my hospital room. I stopped the video. Jenkins sends his regards, he said. He said he'd call the hospital and take care of the bill, and you should find a mall gift certificate in your locker next time you're in. Doctor said you can leave today. No reason to stay overnight. You need a ride back? Get your car? I... I shuddered. I don't know if I can go back there. Maybe I didn't explain what I saw right, but... I said that I wanted to talk to you about something. He cut me off again. I believe that you saw something weird last night. Something you can't explain. You're not the only one who's had that happen. There's a group of us. If you come by tonight around 6pm, we meet in the back room of the Drunken Bard. The gaming store near the food court. Jorge, I said. What's in the mall? What did I see last night? He hesitated. Like he didn't know what to say. Or maybe there was just too much to say. Come talk to us this evening, he said. I gotta get back to work. Listen, I'll understand if you don't want to come. If you quit. 
Most guys, well, they don't really last long on the night shift. I hope to see you this evening, though. If you try to tackle one of those things, you're brave. We could use your help. He left. Statues that move at night, and that YouTuber Amanda that screamed that all the doors disappeared. I don't know if that's real or what happened to her. Maybe that was for a prank channel too. But I just don't know if 850 an hour is worth digging for answers on this one. Anyway, if I can't find a better job or at least meet up with Jorge in this group, I'll definitely let you know how things go. When I stepped into the drunken bard, a slightly overweight guy in his mid-thirties with greasy blonde hair stood behind the counter. He shouted into the phone, Stop asking. We don't sell alcohol. We're a tabletop gaming store, not a liquor store. He slammed the phone down and looked up at me. If you ask for a whiskey or a beer, I'm going to throw these dice at you, he said, clenching a handful of 20-sided dice. Jorge told me to come here. About the... I didn't know how to finish the sentence. The creepy moving statues? The ghosts? Paranormal crap? Aliens, the guy said confidently. He came out from behind the counter. Jorge and the others think their ghosts are from some other spiritual plane, but they're aliens. He wiped his hand on his sweatpants and offered it to me. Reluctantly, I shook it. I'm Luke, he said. He raised his hands and then gestured at everything around him. Proprietor of the fine shop you find yourself in. Seriously, the other store owners look down on me because this is the nerd store, but I make bank. DARE officers should have been warning kids about Magic the Gathering cards, not drugs. Everyone else is in the back room. He pulled out a flask from within his sweatpants. You want a drink? I declined. He led me back. We sat in folding chairs that were arranged in a circle. There were stale donuts and lukewarm coffee on a table in the back. I felt like I unintentionally just joined a support group. Jorge was there, and Luke obviously. Goth yoga girl sat directly across from me, and to my sights was an old man with a patchy white beard. There was also an Asian woman who looked about my mom's age. We should all introduce ourselves. Jorge said. Explain why we're here. I'll start. Brian, as you know, I'm Jorge, one of the day shift security guards. I first became aware of our... He struggled to find the right word. Situation, about two years ago. I was working an evening shift then due to the holidays. I walked into one of the employees' only passageways to make sure that the teens weren't sneaking into any of the storage rooms. According to my watch, I was there for less than 15 minutes, but when I came back into the main mall, I found out I'd been missing for three days. Lost time is a phenomenon commonly connected to alien abductions, Luke said. All of the others groaned. Stop it with the aliens already, the Chinese woman said. She turned to me. I'm Susan. I own the massage parlor by the J.C. Penney. Best Asian massage parlor in town, Luke said. I keep reminding Luke, Susan said. Despite my ethnicity, we primarily use Swedish techniques at my parlor. Yeah, racist, goth yoga girl chimed in. You're Asian and you run a massage parlor. Therefore, it's an Asian massage parlor. I mean, that's just tautology, Luke said. That's not what tautology is. I said. Whatever, Susan said. He stopped calling it an oriental massage parlor. Small victories. I'll hear whispers behind me in my shop. I can't tell what they're saying, but it sounds like they're right next to my ear, telling me a secret in another language. The statues. Jorge said you saw them move. I've seen them do this too. One night I stayed late to do the books. When I locked up, all the other shops were closed. I walked down the corridor to the door that I was told I'd still be able to get out of. It's near one of the fountains with the statues. 
When I got to the end of the corridor, it was strange. All the statues were missing. I thought maybe they got taken down for cleaning. It didn't make any sense to me to do that, but made more sense than anything else. When I got near the door, I heard a sound behind me. Way down at the other end of the corridor, I saw them. All of the statues, and they saw me. I barreled through the exit and got in my car and left. I refused to come back to the mall for days. I told Mr. Jenkins about it. He assured me it was internet pranksters making a video. So I started coming back. But Jorge and the others have convinced me something more is going on here. Everyone then looked at Goth Yogurt Girl next. I don't want to talk about it. She said and folded her arms. Jenna... Jorge said. It'd be good for Brian to... She cut him off. I said I don't want to talk about it, okay? Just not tonight. Jorge nodded. Is it my turn? The old man said. He didn't wait for anyone to respond. Mark Davies, he said. But from November and through December 24th, people here tend to call me Santa Claus. And oh boy, do I have a story for you. You got a minute? Good. Let me start. I used to be quite trim and fit and clean shaven, if you can believe it. And you'd better. Navy man. Sailor during Vietnam. I don't really mention it that casually. It's important to my story, as you'll see. As I said, I used to be a trim and fit and clean shaven man. I was during wartime. From 66 to 67, I was stationed on the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt, or Swanky Frankie, as we like to call her. Named after my least favorite president, but I proudly served on her all the same. For a period of several months, I was a night watch cook, prepping food in the aft kitchen for morning breakfast, as well as serving a late dinner to my fellow night watchmen. So I can relate to you, Mr. Night Watchman Brian, I loved that watch. I was a second class, so I was in charge of the aft kitchen until my first class came down and took over. A hospital corpsman who stood the night watch and I became good friends. We were both smokers, and the smoke deck was a lonely place at 0200. We'd meet out there and talk about what we missed back home. Girls, mostly. We'd also complain about our chain of command. For months we'd met and had these conversations, but one night my friend, Wallace was his name, had an odd look about him when he came to meet me for a smoke. Wallace, what's wrong? I said. A dream, he said, but he wouldn't elaborate any further. The next night, again, Wallace had this sullen look about him. Again I asked him, what's wrong? Uh, it's just a dream. He said. I told him that simply won't do. You gotta tell me about this dream. What has you down, Wallace? But he wouldn't tell me. Not that night. The next night, Wallace meets me at the smoke deck in his dress blues. He looks fine and sharp, but we're out to sea. No reason to be wearing that uniform unless you're going to Captain's Mast. I ask him if he's in trouble. Not at all. He said. His eyes were glazed over, his voice monotone. In fact, tonight is going to be a night to celebrate. I asked him what for. For the past few nights, I've been talking to this woman. She's beautiful. The most beautiful woman I've ever met. And she loves me, Davies. And I love her. We're out to sea. There's no women within miles of the ship. You're wrong. She follows us beneath the water. Wallace, you're sounding kind of crazy. I told him. She's perfect, Davies. In every way. She said that she could hear me when I dreamed. Hear my thoughts. Hear my memories. Everything about me. And she loves me. In my dreams, I've spent years with her already. It's time. It's time I go to her. He walked closer to the side of the ship. Don't go doing what you're thinking of doing. I crept closer to him, afraid of making a sudden move. 
Come with me, he said, and offered his hand. I'm sure that there are others just like her beneath the water. One of them will hear your thoughts and dreams and think you're perfect too. Wouldn't that be so much better than this? I clutched his hand and tried to pull him away from the side of the ship. Tried to put him in a bear hug. I screamed. I need some help on the smoke deck. Someone help me. But while some of my focus was on getting help, Wallace's sole focus was getting out of my grip. And he succeeded. He jumped. I called man overboard, but we never found his body. The smoke deck was aft. His body should have been swept in the propellers, ground up right away. Would have left a pool of blood in the water, but we didn't see that. I won't bore you with all of the details of my life from the end of the war until I became a mall Santa Claus, but slowly I became less trim and fit and clean shaven. That's just how these things go. My third year as Santa, my first year at this particular mall, something happened. A girl was on my lap telling me about the puppy that she wanted for Christmas. When I then looked up into the crowd of parents and all of the children waiting, what I saw, it caused a reaction in me. I almost pushed the girl right off of my lap. Out in the crowd towards the back, he was there. Wallace, young as he was last I saw him, and he held the hand of a beautiful woman with long, beautiful black hair. In front of them was a child that they each had an arm on. It was like they were posing for me, all smiles. Wallace waved when he saw me looking at him, like he was just stopping by to see an old friend. The girl on my lap cried. I looked down at her, and I realized that I had her hand in a death grip. She couldn't let go. Her parents ran up to me and ripped her away. When I looked back into the crowd, Wallace and his family were walking away. But the wife then turned back. Her face, it was no longer beautiful. It was no longer human. Framed with her large black mass of hair were circular rows of sharp fangs, like a lamprey eel. I yelled out to Wallace to warn him but he didn't listen to me. Jenkins threw a fit. The parents threatened to sue them all. He fired me. But during the next Christmas season, well, he couldn't find another Santa. He pays pretty crap wages and the mall's empty. There's not even a proper toy store. No offense, Luke. Any more so, hardly any parents bring their kids. He hired me back. That next year, I was in the restroom on break. I heard a rush of water all around me, then saw Wallace crash through the ceiling and float there, like he just belly flopped into a pool in his dress blues. He looked me in the eyes as he drowned. His body became bloated, then it ripped apart, a thousand baby eels tearing through his corpse. I've got more stories like that and more, but I think you get the point. Don't you, Mr. Night Watchman? After Mark finished his story, Luke passed him his flask. Mark gladly accepted it. There was then a silence in the room then. Luke began to tell me about the time an alien appeared in a store and how he whooped it with a broadsword, but he didn't get far into his story until Jorge stopped him. Said maybe we all heard enough for the night. I got the sense that no one believed he was telling the truth anyways. We agreed to meet again in a few days. I wanted to talk to goth yogurt girl, Jenna, but she ran off as soon as the meeting was over. And then Jorge cornered me. I convinced Jenkins that I need to be on the night shift too, he said. I told him the mall YouTube videos are trending, so if you stay on, you won't be alone here at night. We can figure this out together. But why stay? I said. It's a dying mall. Why not just leave it? What you heard tonight, that's not even half of what's wrong with this place, Jorge said. People go missing around here. Kids. What if they're out there somewhere? What if we can still save them? But can we save them? I don't know. But what if it spreads? Say we do abandon them all. Maybe whatever's here stays contained within. 
Maybe it disappears. Or maybe it spreads. It bursts like a boil onto the rest of our community. Right now it's contained. We can handle it. Stop it. If it spreads, I'm not sure we'd be able to. So, will you stay with us? Will you help us figure out what's wrong here and stop it? I didn't answer him right away. My eyes glanced around the room, trying to avoid his. But they found Mark's. He was listening to our conversation, waiting to hear what I'd say. You know what? Yeah, I said. I'll help. I mean, Jenkins just gave me a $25 gift card for the mall. If I don't help you guys, I won't have anywhere to spend it. I'll update you all later. Half of Jorge was bent inside the server rack for the CCTV system. He had a soldering gun. I held my phone and I was reading off instructions from a PDF. Smoke rose from inside. Damn it, Jorge said. He jumped out of the server rack. We made it worse. Um, we? I said. Yeah, we're a team. I mess up, you mess up. Even if there's not a warranty still, can't we just call the manufacturer? I asked. Jorge pointed to the company's branding on the side. It read, Holloway Systems. And there was a picture of some kind of insect. Try googling it. Look it up however you want, but I'm telling you, there's nothing. There's a phone number you can call, but a computer answers and just starts spouting off random numbers. Like a puzzle or something. Not really super helpful tech support. Jorge reached down to his duffel bag. Don't worry, I got a backup plan. Inside were a bunch of GoPros, or cheap knockoffs at least. So, we're gonna put those up all over the mall? I asked. Exactly, he said. Put them up in inconspicuous places, but where they can see as much ground as possible. And I got an app that we can use on our phones to check back and forth between each camera. We didn't split up while placing the cameras. We made sure to maintain light of sight on each other and work different ends of the same corridors. Walking away from Jorge after grabbing another camera, a quarter was on the ground in front of the arcade. When I picked it up, I heard the sound of arcade games. I took the quarter and glanced inside the arcade. Lights emanated from within. Still shutters were locked in front of the entrance, but along the back wall, a single machine glowed. Galaga. There was a young boy facing away from me, playing the machine. Light burst from it, and it silhouetted the boy. I froze in place. The boy's hands stopped moving the controls. He slowly turned toward me, but I sprinted away before he could see me. Before I could see him. I crashed into Jorge. What's wrong? He said. The arcade was dark. The light from the Galaga machine no longer shooting from behind the still shutters. But in my hand, I still held the quarter. I showed it to Jorge. I found a quarter. That's all. A quarter? Jorge said. Jesus, I know we don't make much money, but don't get that excited over some change. It took the rest of the night to hook up the cameras. We tested them on Jorge's phone as we went. My mind kept wandering back to the arcade. The boy. I didn't see his face, but I recognize him. Years ago, I killed him. My shake, this time a combo of deathly dark chocolate and caffeinated cappuccino, was nearly empty. Jenna sat across from me in the back of her shop. She'd flag me down before my shift started. It's just hard to talk about, she said. Can you tell me about it? I asked. I really want to, she said. So, I've worked in the mall since my senior year of high school. I know you'll find this hard to believe, but my first job was at Hot Topic. I mean, it was whatever. I was spending a ton of money there anyway, so it made sense. After several weeks, I noticed this guy from school, Dylan, that kept coming in on nights that I worked, and he wasn't exactly our target demographic. 
He played football and basketball and never really listened to a song that wasn't in the top 40s or on a Christian radio station. I had this real breakfast club view of clicks. He was a jock. I was a freak. I figured he was there to make fun of me. I mean, Emilio Estevez's jock character wouldn't hook up with Ali Sheedy, right? He'd want Molly Ringwald. Molly Ringwald's popular girl character, Claire, ends up with Judd Nelson's bad boy character, John Bender in The Breakfast Club. I interrupted her. Yeah, I know. I've seen the movie. Jenna said. Well, Emilio Estevez's jock character actually does end up with Ali Sheedy's freak character. I said. Okay, fine. I meant like The Breakfast Club. You know, like the beginning of the movie? When none of the kids get along because they're all in different cliques? It was before they smoke, dance, and learn that they're all the same on the inside, she said. But you get what I mean, right? Jocks just don't go for the freak girls. They go for pretty popular girls. At least, that's what I believed in high school. Now, can we please get back to my story? So Dylan kept coming to Hot Topic on nights that I worked. When he was there, he'd ask me dumb questions about stuff we sold or if we could special order him khakis and polo shirts, since that was more of his style. I thought he was making fun of me and the stuff that I liked, until one night he came in with a boombox and then blasted my chemical romance, walked up to me with a black corsage and asked if I'd go to homecoming with him. At first, I thought he was teasing me, but he had the most sincere sweet look on his face, and that's when I realized, oh my god, this guy's into me. So we dated. We were inseparable. Pretty much any night that I didn't have work or he didn't have practice or a game, we'd be out together or go over to his house. Dylan had a dog named Riley, this adorable miniature Australian shepherd that was obsessed with him. You could tell Dylan was her favorite. Anytime we were at his place, she'd follow us around, want to sit on his lap or just be near him. And Dylan's mother, I thought she hated me. I mean... I'm the goth girl dating her clean-cut athlete son, but she was wonderful. She always thought to ask me how different tests went at school and how I was doing and feeling. She didn't ask these questions in passing. I got the sense that she really cared about the answers. She cared about me. His whole family was like that. They were Catholic and they went to Mass every week, and that wasn't my thing, but they'd always invite me to go with them. I loved that, that they wanted me to be a part of their lives in that way. A few months into our relationship, we talked about sex. I won't go into the details other than to say that we had a hard time finding private places that we could do it. So even back then, the mall was dying. A lot of the shops were closed. Not as bad as now, but the place could definitely be a ghost town. I realized I knew a place we could be intimate with each other. The Hot Topic Storage Room It wasn't attached to the store. It was down an employee's only hallway, and the room had a lock. No one ever went back to it. It was mostly where we kept all of the seasonal stuff. Dylan meets me after work one night, and we snuck into the storage room. Towards the back, there was a set of metal doors. They had gravings across them and a green patina. I'd never seen them before, but that didn't really surprise me. There easily could have been boxes blocking them from view. Dylan asked, What's behind the doors? I told him I didn't know. Maybe it's a furniture storage room, he said. Maybe there's a bed. He was joking, but he opened the door. Inside, it was pitch black. I told him to forget about it, but without discussion, without thought, he just walked in. The door slammed shut behind him. He pounded the other side. I twisted the knobs, but to no avail. I yelled at him to come back out. That it wasn't funny. After about a minute, maybe less or more, he just stopped pounding. Dylan, are you alright? I asked. I kept asking him, but he didn't respond. And the doors disappeared. Jenna stopped speaking. She kept her eyes on the ground. I'm so sorry, I said. So he disappeared? Her eyes looked up and into mine. Her mascara was a mess. 
The story's not over, she said. Not even close. I turned around and Dylan was in front of me. He was disoriented. Pale. He couldn't tell me what happened to him. I drove him home and helped him back inside. I lied to his mother. I told her that he looked like he was coming down with the flu. I didn't see him for a week. He didn't show up for school. He didn't respond to my phone calls. His mother wouldn't let me see him. She said that he still wasn't feeling well. She sounded different now, like she suspected I had something to do with whatever was going on with her son. I went back to the storage room. The doors weren't there. I felt like maybe I imagined them. After about a week of not seeing him or not talking to him, I invited myself over to their family dinner. I'd been to dozens over the past several months. Dylan sat at the table with his family. He looked great, and he was chipper. All smiles. Back to how I remembered him. How I loved him. But his parents, they didn't hide their disdain for me. That they felt something was wrong. Dylan, tell Jen about what happened to Riley, his mother said. I killed her. He said between bites of chicken. I ran her over with the car. His voice expressed no remorse. No sadness for the dog that adored him. I'm so sorry, I said. Are you alright? Are you okay? What do you mean? I'm wonderful, he said. His mother glared at me. You're not sad? I asked. Dylan looked around the table, reading our expressions. Of course, he said. I'm sad. But he made no effort to show it. I helped Dylan's mother clear the plates. In the kitchen, she cornered me. Tell me what's wrong with my son, she asked. What did you do to him? I, I don't know, I said. He killed his dog, Jenna, a dog that he loved and that loved him more than anything. He's had Riley most of his life, and he killed her. I saw him do it. It wasn't an accident. He killed his dog on purpose. What did you do to him that last night you spent with him? Did you do satanic magic on my son? What did you do? She grabbed my wrists and dug her nails deep into them. I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with him. Dylan entered. Is everything okay here? He asked. Jenna said she's leaving. His mother said. She released my wrists. They were bleeding. Oh. Dylan said. I'm sorry you're going so soon. He pressed me into his body and then shoved his lips onto mine. He held the back of my head and forced me to stay attached to him, in front of his mother. His other hand wandered from my back and then cupped my butt. I pulled away. Goodbye, Jenna, he said. We didn't break up, not really, but we weren't a couple anymore. Friends asked what happened between us and I'd just cry. I had no idea what to tell them. I tried once to ask him about the night in the storage room, about the doors, but I couldn't do it. When I looked into his eyes, I just knew he wasn't my Dylan anymore. After high school, I thought I'd be able to move on, put Dylan in my past, but I also couldn't help myself. Dylan got a scholarship to Notre Dame. Halfway through freshman year of college, I checked their newspaper's website. A girl at his school had gone missing. My first thought was that Dylan was responsible, but that I thought I'd sound obsessed if I said that to anyone. A crazy ex-girlfriend who thinks the worst of her ex-boyfriend. The following semester, I checked the site again. Another girl had disappeared. I called the local police department from a payphone and left an anonymous message to check Dylan's dorm room. They found a knife with both girls' DNA on it. He's in prison now. Sometimes, late at night, my phone rings. It's his mother. She sobs and screams at me. What did you do to my son? One time I tried to explain what happened in the storage room, but it just didn't go well. She took it as confirmation that I'd done something satanic to him. I've heard she screamed about me at mass, that she's begged the priest to deal with me, to fix her son. 
A few people a month come up to me and ask me about Dylan, about my satanic temple in the mall. When we first met, when you asked me about anything weird in the mall, I thought that's what you were getting at. I lie to myself every day. Tell myself that what happened in the storage room had nothing to do with Dylan's personality change. That there's nothing wrong or evil here. That's why I bought this shop. To convince myself that I believe the lie more than the truth. But I know the truth. That I took a perfect and wonderful boy and corrupted his soul. Not on purpose, of course, but still. It's my fault. Jenna cried. I put my arms around her and I held her. I told her it wasn't her fault. She had no idea what would happen. Anything I could think of to make her feel better. I'm not sure how long we stood like that, but after some time, my walkie-talkie went off. Brian, Jorge said. Get down to the security office now. I gotta go, I said. That's fine, she said. I need to close the shop anyway, but you should come by again tomorrow before your shift, she said before squeezing my hand. The quickest route to the security office involves going past the arcade. It was shuttered by the time I walked by. Inside, the boy played Galaga. Light shot from the arcade cabinet and almost blinded me. I kept walking, but I reached into my pocket and I felt the quarter that I'd found when I first saw him. I don't know how it was possible, but I'm sure it's the same one I put in his coffin. More happened that night, but I'll have to update you later. Jorge pointed at the CCTV monitors as I entered the security office. One of the four was on. It showed a hallway crowded with people in stores that I didn't recognize. I mean, I recognized the corridor that the camera showed, but there were no active stores there now. They were all empty. Is it playing a tape? I asked. Like security footage from years ago? No, he said. There's no tape in the system. It's a live feed. At least I think it is. I have a way to test it. I'm gonna walk down there, get on camera, and walkie-talkie back to you. Tell me if you see me. Man, that's a terrible plan, I said. The mall's trying to think of a way to split us up, and you're playing right into it. Hey, I know what I'm doing, Jorge said. I've been here longer than you. Besides, the CCTV is one of the few tools that we have to fight this thing. It's not a tool we're using to fight whatever's here. It's part of the mall, I said. We'll see about that, he said. Keep your eyes on the monitor. He then left without giving me some time to stop him. It didn't take long for Jorge to reach where the camera showed. Shoppers walked by and into the stores. You got visual? Jorge said over the walkie-talkie. I see you, I said. Shoppers scrolled by him. Weirdly enough, they moved around him, like they felt he was there. Do you see anything? Or anyone? Nothing, he said. Empty closed shops and the corridor is completely devoid of people. The monitor turned off. Jorge? I said. No response. Jorge, I lost the image. Are you there? No response. The knockoff GoPros. Jorge had helped me install the app for them on my phone. I brought it up. Yo, you there or not? Jorge said. A different CCTV monitor then turned on. Jorge stood in the same place he'd been, but the stores were different behind him, and the people were too. The shoppers no longer moved. They stood rigidly in place. I'm here, I said. You need to get back here. What do you see? He said. The monitor just turned off. The monitor then went off. Jorge, do you hear me? No response. Jorge, you need to get out of there right now. No response. I flipped through the GoPro camera feeds. I couldn't find Jorge on any of them. A different CCTV monitor then turned on. Jorge stood where he'd been, but now he was surrounded by shoppers. 
all gazing right at him. Their heads tilted and mouths agape, unblinking. Jorge, I said. Get out of... The monitor turned off before I finished my sentence. I'm not sure if he heard me. He didn't respond. The fourth monitor turned on. Surrounding him were metal statues. Dozens of them. The mall didn't even have that many. Holy crap. He said. Jesus. Jesus Christ. Brian, are you seeing this? I didn't like passively watching the monitors as they showed Jorge getting further into danger. I sprinted to him. When I got to his corridor, Jorge stood alone. What happened? I asked. Got me, he said. They were here. Then they weren't. We spent the next few hours in Jorge's car. We used the knockoff GoPro's app to keep a look on the inside. So nothing changed around you? I asked. None of the stores, the people? That's what I'm telling you, Jorge said. There were no people. There was nothing. And then all of the metal statues were just in my face. I'm seeing something from camera 9, I said. There's a light moving around. What is it? Jorge checked the feed on his phone. Crap, he said. I recognize him. We need to go back inside. When we found him, he was in front of the same fountain and statues that first spooked me. He wore a hiking backpack and a scuba tank, carried a K-bar in one hand and a flashlight in the other. He dressed like he was ready for war, on land and underwater. Don't stop me, Jorge, he said. Daniel, I don't know what you're planning, but why don't we talk about it? That's all you ever want to do. Daniel said. You and your support group. You talk, cry, relive your trauma. Not me. I figured it out. I know where she is. I'm not sure if I can bring her back, but I can try. What have you figured out? I asked. Daniel then glanced my way. He stepped on the fountain, equal level with the metal statues. Unafraid of them. The fountain stood between us and him. He kept his eyes on both Jorge and me. My eyes kept going from Daniel's to the statues, wondering if they'd intervene in some way. We're making progress, Jorge said. This is Brian. He and I have been documenting more of what's happening here. He attacked one of the statues. I ended up in the hospital, I said. But he fought one. I'm not sure I'd call what I did fighting the statue, but Jorge was attempting to convince Daniel not to do something that I suspected was reckless. Daniel held his hand over the fountain, then cut his palm open with the K-bar. Blood spilled into the water. It wasn't much, just a few drops. But the red liquid began to swirl like a miniature whirlpool. The water itself remained still. Come to the drunken bard, Jorge said. Tomorrow night, everyone will be there. Meet with us again, at least one last time. Let us know what you've learned. Maybe we can all help you, and if not, I promise, we won't stand in your way. Daniel's eyes then traveled from the swirling pool of his own blood to us. He put away the knife and took out a cloth to bandage his hand. Fine, he said. He hopped down from the fountain ledge and walked towards the nearest exit. Anyone want to get pancakes? I haven't eaten in days in preparation for tonight, and I'm starving. I'll meet you at the IHOP around the corner. Should we clean the blood? I asked Jorge. I mean, it's probably not sanitary or safe to leave a swirling pool of blood in a public fountain, right? I'll take care of it, Jorge said. Go with Daniel. Don't worry, I'll be fine. I think this place only has enough energy to do so much in a single night. That's not a theory I want to test, I said. By the way, who is Daniel exactly? What's his role in all of this? He's a YouTuber, Jorge said. At least, he and his sister Amanda used to be. 
And with that, I left for the IHOP to go hear Daniel's story. Daniel stabbed his pancakes with a fork, tore them into huge chunks, and threw them down his throat. I'm not sure one can enjoy eating that way, but he seemed satisfied. He caught me staring at his method of ingesting food. You're judging, he said. No, not at all. I started. People who eat pancakes in a dainty manner are insufferable, and you shouldn't tolerate them. But I didn't come to hear his thoughts on breakfast food consumption. Tell me about your sister, why you became YouTubers and tried to ghost hunt in the mall. You don't need to know our whole backstory, Daniel said. Amanda and I, I mean, I started on YouTube first. She's my little sister, so of course she had to copy me. Her channel got bigger though. She mostly did makeup tutorials and vlogs. I did pranks. It was dumb stuff, really. A few of them I even did in the mall. Pushing friends into fountains. That sort of thing. Oh yeah, I watched a few of those videos. I said. Did you hit like or subscribe? Daniel asked. I didn't. Oh well. He shoved more pancakes into his mouth. I'll tell you what happened the night she disappeared. The night we ghost hunted. So, Amanda's channel got more popular than mine. And, I mean, by a lot. Tens of thousands of subscribers compared to my measly few hundred. She could tell I was jealous. First, she offered me advice on different directions that I could go with my videos. But I resented that my younger sister knew better than me. Then she tried to get me to collab with her in her vlogs. She could give me a makeover or something and link back to my channel. But that was too girly for me. Around that time, I noticed ghost hunting videos were really trending. That sounded cool and I'd heard stories about the mall being creepy. So I asked if she wanted to do a joint video series where we ghost hunted in the mall together. I'd done prank videos there before. She did vlogs, so it felt like a good fusion of both of our channels. She didn't want to. She said she scared easily, and she did. But I kept bugging her, so she agreed. I was really worried we wouldn't get any interesting content, despite breaking into a mall after hours. I mean, it'd be shots of empty hallways. That's it. So I set it up like this. Both of us would vlog beforehand, hide in different restrooms until the place was closed, and then we'd both go out and shoot videos. I'd stage a ghost prank on her. That way she'd capture something scary for her channel and her getting freaked out, and then have it revealed it was just me. And on my channel, people would watch me setting up the prank and carrying it out from my view. Awesome idea, right? But it was also predicated on the mall not actually being haunted. I hid in one of the bathroom stalls on the second level. Since it was far from an exit, I figured people would be less likely to come into it as they left for the night. Amanda said she'd be in one of the ground floor restrooms at the opposite end. We were to meet two hours after the last shop closed, somewhere in the middle. An hour after sitting alone in the restroom, there was a noise. A hum. It was innocuous at first. One of those random sounds you hear in the background and forget about. Maybe there was an HVAC system nearby, but it got louder. No, maybe not louder, deeper. My skull vibrated. It made sitting there uncomfortable. But I didn't get up. I didn't want to leave yet. I figured I'd get caught if I left too soon. There were footsteps then. Loud and slow. They took deliberate steps to the first stall, opened the door, and flushed the toilet. Shortly after, water spilled to the floor. They moved to the next stall and did the same thing. More water filled the floor. I crouched in the next stall with my legs up and the door locked. Polished black shoes came into view. They didn't try the handle. They stood there for a moment but moved to the next stall. Flushing it. Water filling the floor. They let the water flow from all the sinks. The space flooded. The sound of something hitting the floor came from the first stall, then the next, and then the one on the other side of me. I wanted to run, but I couldn't. 
How much of a coward would I be to run away because there was water on the floor and strange sounds? From beneath both sides of my stall, lamprey eels slithered into view. They lunged at me. I stumbled out the stall. A man in a wool suit smiled at me through the mirror as he washed his hands. He had to be the one flushing the toilets and turning the sinks on. What's wrong, chump? He said. I didn't get a chance to answer him. He turned to face me, but he had no smiling face. His true face was that of a lamprey ill. He then reached for me with water dripping from his hands. Dozens of eels swarmed into the pool of water that was the restroom floor. I darted out the door. I didn't stop there. I kept running down the hall. Only when I was hundreds of feet away did I turn around to see if the man or his eels were after me. He wasn't there, but the sound, the vibration in my head, it was still present. The hum made it hard to concentrate, to focus. I kept my thoughts simple. Find Amanda and get out. You two be damned. If it weren't for the hum, I'd have found her sooner. She was running too, but on the ground floor. I yelled down to her and we met at the stairwell. One goal accomplished. Now we needed to find a way out. We made our way to where a neon exit sign directed us, but there was no escape, only a brick wall. We ran to the end of another corridor where an exit should have been, should have been, but there wasn't. We were walled in. Third time's the charm? Yeah, people say that for a reason. It wasn't applicable to us. Not that night. The third exit we tried was a brick wall. Water rushed towards Amanda and I. Not much, mind you, but a few inches worth of the ground. But it meant the whole mall was flooded. We ran again down one last hall. Towards one last exit. And here we found one. A copper door in the middle of the hallway. The metal contained embellishments and had a patina. Near the door were pillars with mirror surfaces. They distorted our reflections like a funhouse mirror. Amanda and I tried to open the strange door that stood in the middle of the hall. There was a stomping, slow and deliberate, behind us. In the mirrored pillars, I saw him again. The smiling man in the wool suit. I avoided looking directly at him. I told Amanda not to turn around. Oh... You don't want to go in there, chum and chumette, he said. Nothing good ever comes out of going in there. I don't remember exactly what happened next. The hum. It affected my memory. There's some kind of gap. The next thing I remember is Amanda standing in the middle of the fountain. The one you found me at tonight. Only the statues around her look different. Normally they're metallic with blank faces. That night, they had the faces of lamprey eels, and they looked at her with hunger. Her eyes were filled with fear. I blinked, and then I was outside in the parking lot. I don't know how, but I was. Amanda wasn't with me. I called security. Jorge responded. He came, as did the city police. We searched for her, but she wasn't there. Neither was the water, the hum, or the smiling man in the wool suit. There was no evidence that night. Except some of my sister's video footage somehow ended up online on a strange site. I don't know how, but it did. I carry a guilt with me. I introduced my sister to posting videos on YouTube. I became jealous of her success, and I convinced her to go ghost hunting with me. Whatever has happened to her, it's my fault. Wherever she is now, I don't believe she's dead. She doesn't deserve to be there. No one does. I have more I could tell you, Daniel said. I've traveled and researched, but I'd like to wait until tomorrow night to share what I found with the others as well. I don't know all of it, but I know enough. Maybe to get Amanda back. I met the artist, the one who sold the statues to Jenkins. An interesting Vietnamese man. Daniel got up to leave. I'll see you tomorrow night. 
As he left, I realized he didn't pay for his pancakes. My phone vibrated. I checked and the knockoff GoPro app had an alert. I opened it. It showed a live camera feed pointed directly at the arcade. Jorge stood in front, the still shutters open. He walked inside. Jorge! I shouted as I ran down the corridor towards the arcade. He didn't answer. I didn't step foot into the arcade. My eyes darted around the machines, searching for him. My hand unconsciously grabbed the quarter in my pocket. In the back, on the Galaga machine, the boy in the arcade played his game. He didn't turn to me. He knew I was there. You can have the next game, he said. I'm not here to play, I said. You'll have to eventually, the boy in the arcade said. I threw the quarter at him. Keep it, I said. Use it to play as many games as you want. The quarter was in my back hand. The boy in the arcade stepped away from the machine. If you get the high score, I'll leave you alone, he said. Promise. I stepped inside the arcade. I expected it to be a trap, for the steel shutters to close behind me. But nothing happened. I made my way to the back. In the reflection of the Galaga's monitor, I saw his face. My childhood best friend. But when I looked directly at the boy in the arcade, his true face showed. The lamprey ill. Rows of sharp fangs arranged in circles. I didn't put the quarter in. I waited for the high scores to show themselves on the screen. JSM in all ten spots. Joshua Samuel Myers. Just like when we were kids. I held the quarter out to the boy in the arcade. In my head, I kept calling the creature with the lamprey ill face that. Because he wasn't Josh. Not really. Josh would always beat me at this game. I said. That's why he thought he should get to keep the magic quarter. When I was 12 years old, I found a magic quarter on the sidewalk the last week of school. At least, that's what my best friend and I came to call it. Because when you put it in the Galaga machine at Joe's Pizza, it gave you a game but always came back out in the coin return. Unlimited free games. That summer was the hottest of my youth. Both Josh and my family didn't run the air conditioning on account of our families being poor, but Joe's Pizza was a constant 68 degrees all summer long. And as long as we paid to play games, Joe didn't mind if we hung out there all day. I always shared the magic quarter with Josh, and he'd always get higher scores. But that wasn't enough for Josh. He believed because he was the better Galaga player that he should get to keep the magic quarter, that it was rightfully his. Now, I subscribe more to the rule of finders keepers. I found the magic quarter, therefore it was mine. Regardless of how bad I was at the game. Josh offered me money. Five bucks, ten, twenty, and I almost said yes to twenty. That's a lot of money for a twelve-year-old, and even then, I could tell our friendship was falling apart. All over a quarter, but I still turned down his offer. I wanted to keep that small piece of magic. One day towards the end of summer, outside Joe's, we argued one last time about the quarter. He tried to take it from me by force. I pushed him. I pushed him so hard that he fell into the street. Both of us were so engaged in our fight, we didn't notice the car coming. It killed him instantly. I killed my best friend over a quarter in an arcade game. My palm was open with the magic quarter in it. I stared directly at the boy in the arcade. At the rows of sharp teeth pointing at me. It's not mine anymore, I said. It's Josh's. If you want to use it now, that's fine too. I just know it's not mine. When he refused to take it from me, I left it on the Galaga machine. I walked towards the exit. Hey, what the heck are you doing in there? Jorge yelled. He came running at me as I exited the arcade. I turned back around. The boy in the arcade was gone. So was the quarter. Nothing, I said. I came looking for you. 
I thought you might be in trouble. I'll update you all later. Jenna and I took the long way to the drunken bard. I wanted to see something first. I told Jenna about the boy in the arcade, Josh, and the magic quarter. No one played the Galaga machine. The light emitted by the game was dim. Guess the evil presence, or whatever you want to call it, realized it couldn't get to you, Jenna said. I came to term with Josh's death years ago, I said. I'm not scared of whatever's in this mall. I'm more offended by its crass use of my dead friend to serve its purpose. Let's hear what Daniel has to say. Maybe he knows a way to stop it. Daniel threw a folding chair against the wall of the back room of the drunken bard. I won't admit anything, he said, because I didn't do it. Why don't you admit what you did? Jorge held Luke back from him while Mark and I stood between Daniel and Luke. Jenna didn't hide her amusement at their arguing, while Susan couldn't hide her contempt for the childish anger that erupted out of Luke and Daniel the moment Daniel entered the back room. I won't say I did anything until you cop up to what you did, Luke said. Fine, I'll be the bigger man here, Daniel said. I created a dozen fake accounts on Yelp and gave you one star from each of them. Luke once again tried to lunge at Daniel, but Jorge restrained him. Once he calmed down, he confessed. I paid a bot farm to mass downvote your YouTube videos and also copyright strike you. Daniel picked up another chair to throw, this time presumably at Luke, but Mark and I stopped him. Children, Susan said. She didn't stand up or even raise her voice, but something in her tone quieted them both down. Stop it. We have more important matters to discuss. Declare a ceasefire now. My store lost so much business, I had to bribe. Luke stopped talking when Susan glared at him. Mar put the chair that Daniel threw back in the circle. You boys done? He said. They nodded. Everyone took their seats. Mr. Percy Jenkins, proprietor of this mall, Daniel started. Wouldn't disclose to me the artist who created the statues found at the end of every corridor. Strange, because he's proud of them and will brag to anyone who visits this mall that a famous artist created these metallic humanoid statues. They're aliens, Luke muttered. Any idiot can see that. I agree, an idiot does see that, Daniel said. What'd you call me? Luke said, jumping out of his chair. No, not again. Jorge said. He stood in the middle of the back room like a referee at a boxing match. Daniel, continue. But no more insults, veiled or explicit, aimed at Luke. And Luke, no more commentary about aliens. They reluctantly nodded. Continuing. Daniel said. I won't bore you with the details, but eventually I was able to trick Jenkins into disclosing the art dealer where he bought the statues from. Not the artist himself, mind you. The art dealer at first would not give me the name of the sculptor who created the statues. The dealer had told Jenkins that a famous artist named Luck Fan had made them, but that's not exactly true. Luck Fan is not a sculptor. He's not an artist of any kind. He owns a ship that ports in Ho Chi Minh. He uses it primarily to search for scrap metal in the South China Sea. He and his son Ben ran this business together. They'd go out on the water for days or sometimes weeks on end. Luck would steer the ship while Ben searched beneath the water for anything of value with the radar. But when I talked to him, Luck said his son had a preternatural ability to find valuable items under the water. Oftentimes on intuition alone, he'd tell his father to stop the ship, dive into the sea, and resurface saying something of value was beneath them. During one of their expeditions, their ship broke down. It happened before. Luck would radio to the store and request assistance towing his ship back to the mainland for repairs. This time was no different, but the ship broke down far out. It was late in the day. The towboat would not make it until the next day. Across the earth, there are several places known as blue holes. These are sinkholes that exist at the bottom of the oceans. 
In the South China Sea, there's one that's over 300 meters deep, referred to as the Dragon Hole. Luck and Ben's ship broke down near it. Ben had never dived into the Dragon Hole before. Doing so is said to be dangerous, but they had some time to kill, and he told his father that he sensed there was something of value down there. Ben stayed underwater longer than he normally did. Luck worried something had happened to his son. Luck was preparing to go into the water himself when he heard a voice from behind him. I've returned, father. Ben said. Luck embraced his son, worried that he drowned. His son did not return his affection. His gaze was distant and whole demeanor laconic. What did you find down there? Luck asked. Many things, Ben said. At the bottom of the dragon hole, there are engraved doors. Copper with a patina coating them. They're magnificent. Are they from a ship? Is there wreckage? His father asked. No, Ben said. They are the doors to a kingdom. The dragon hole shows up in Journey to the West, a piece of Chinese literature from the Ming Dynasty. The story published in the 1590s tells of an underwater kingdom found within the hole and ruled over by a dragon. At least most translations say the king is a dragon. Some versions referred to him as an enormous eel, one that fell from the heavens and burrowed deep into the earth to create a gateway back to his true home. But Lug didn't know any of this at the time. He'd find it out years later when trying to ascertain what happened to his son. How do you know the doors led to a kingdom? Luck asked his son. There's more down there too, Ben said. Statues of women and men, as big as you and I. Their faces flawless and beautiful. We need to bring them up, take them with us. That's impossible, Luck said. We don't have the equipment to reach down that far or tow things like that up. They argued, but Luck convinced Ben to get some sleep. The Tobo would be there early in the morning. When Luck walked into the deck the next day, he was frightened of what he had found. Dozens of statues spread all over his ship, each with a human body, but the multiple rows of fangs like the mouth of a lamprey eel. Ben was already awake. His father found him close to one of the statues, gently stroking the side of its head. Where did these statues come from? Luck asked. I dove back into the water last night and brought them up, Ben said. You're lying. That's impossible, Luck said. Ben stopped stroking the statue. He turned to his father. Nothing is impossible for me now. The towboat arrived and brought them back to Ho Chi Minh. Father and son did not speak for the rest of the journey nor did they for weeks after. Ben remained obsessed with the statues. He ceased to work, instead choosing to stay with them, whispering and caressing them. Luck found an art dealer. The dealer hated the faces. He suggested that they might sell easier if they were smoothed over to appear blank. Luck told the dealer he could do whatever he wanted with them. He sold the statues for practically nothing, his true payment was being rid of them and hopefully getting his son back. But Ben was outraged at his father. He attacked him. The last time Luck saw Ben, son grappled with father. Ben tried to bite his father, and when he did, Luck swore he saw multiple rows of fangs in Ben's mouth. Luck stabbed his son, and Ben fled into the night. He stole a boat from the harbor. It was found above the dragon hole. Ben has not been seen since. In the time since, Daniel said, Luck has researched the dragon hole, the statues, and anything related to them. He taught me a ritual, one I believe I can use to summon my sister back. It's what you caught me doing the other night, Jorge. It's dangerous. Honestly, it's probably a good thing you stopped me. I'd likely be killed attempting it alone. I could really use all your help. We'll help, Jorge said without hesitating. We'll get your sister back. I'm in, Jenna said. 
She looked at me. Yeah, I said. Yeah, let's perform an occult ritual to open a gateway into an ill god's kingdom. That sounds like a reasonable responsibility for someone who makes $8.50 an hour. I couldn't help my shipmate decades ago, Mark said. But if I can, I'll help you and your sister now. Complication, guys, Luke said. So, Susan and I have some big news. Are you engaged? I asked. Susan gave me a look of judgment and nausea. What? No, she said. How could you even suggest that? The news, Luke continued, is that we bought a mini mall downtown. It's a few storefronts. Two of them are empty, so we're both moving our shops. I'm sorry, Susan said, but I just want to run a business. I'm not interested in performing occult rituals or taking on strange ill ghosts or whatever they are. Ditto that, Luke said. I know you guys think highly of me, like Neo in The Matrix or John Wick or some other Keanu Reeves badass character, but I'm just a simple businessman who just wants to sell Warhammer figurines. Fine, Daniel said to Luke. But if we survive this tonight, I'm going to leave your new store a million one stars on Yelp. They resumed their argument. Three hours after the mall's closing time, we let everyone in. Daniel had everything that he had the night before. Mark carried a pistol. Jorge and I had tasers since they were a part of our uniforms. Were we supposed to bring weapons? Jenna asked. Am I the only one who doesn't have one? You can have my taser, I said. Don't worry, we shouldn't need anything. Daniel said, putting his duffel bag down. After he and Luke stopped arguing a second time, we asked him for details on the ritual we'd be performing. What it did exactly and what our role would be. How we could prepare. Daniel told us not to worry about the details. He'd take care of everything. That didn't sit well with anyone, but Daniel took off before we could question him further. He said he had preparations to take care of. We stood on the edge of the fountain. The same we'd found Daniel at the night before. The same I'd first seen a statue's head look at me. We stood between the statues. Being so close to them made me uneasy. Daniel held his left hand over the water, palm up. Knife in his right hand, he cut his palm, turned his left hand over, and let his blood fall into the water. Blood in the water, he said. This will bring the predators to us. And what then? Mark asked. What's the rest of the ritual to protect us from them? Oh, there is none, Daniel said. I'm sacrificing all of you to the ill king. Before any of us had a chance to react, the statues grabbed us. Their faces shifted, turning back to their original forms, that of lamprey ills. What are you doing? Jorge said. Last night, Daniel said, I tricked you. I knew you'd be on overnight security, that if I broke into the mall, you'd catch me, that I could convince you and all your stupid support group to come tonight and help me. But I don't need your help, Jorge. After I talked to Luck Fan, I went to the dragon hole myself. I dove inside of it and found the copper doors. I went through them into the ill's kingdom, searching for my sister. And I found her. She's one of his servants now. So's your friend Wallace, Mark. He couldn't believe what luck he had. Filling your presence through the statues. The copper doors then appeared about a dozen feet from the fountain. The water in the fountain swirled. As it did, it changed. Hundreds of lamprey eels moved like a whirlpool in the fountain. One of the eels' faces, I swear I saw it change to Amanda's. Wallace... Mark said. I see him in the swirl. You get a choice, Daniel said. Go through the copper doors and meet your new god, or become food to his children. Before any of us had a chance to answer, music came over the mall's loudspeakers. When doves cry by Prince. Did you hook your phone up to the loudspeaker? Jorge asked me. Wasn't me, I said. Hello there. Luke said, wearing a Jedi robe and carrying some weird metal stick attached to a contraption on his back. 
Sorry about the song. It was supposed to be metallic, you know, to intimidate you, he said to Daniel. I changed my mind and I thought that I could help if the statues came alive. Daniel hopped off the fountain. Two of the statues followed behind him. What's with the nerdy outfit? Daniel asked. Oh, this? Luke said. I went to San Diego Comic Con a few years ago as a Jedi. The statues moved to grab him. Only thing is, I wanted to have an ultra-realistic lightsaber. So I bought this Mexican thermal lance. Illegal in the United States. They wouldn't let me bring it into the convention center. Hey Mark, don't you guys use these things in the Navy to cut through bulkheads? We do, actually, Mark said. You think it could cut through creepy statues? It didn't remain an open question for long. Luke chopped the head off one statue and threw the torso of the other. I've taken kendo lessons since grade school, just in case lightsabers become real, he said. Daniel backed away from him. The statues that were holding us then let go and moved towards Luke. From beneath his robes, he pulled out a second thermal lance. My whole life has been preparation for this moment, he said as he ran at the statues. Meanwhile, Daniel crept towards the copper doors. Mark rushed to pick his gun back up. It's been fun catching up, guys, he said, but I really ought to be going. He put his hand on the door handle, but Jenna was waiting for him with my taser. Daniel fell to the ground convulsing. Let's keep those doors closed, she said. As Luke chopped through the statues, the copper doors flickered in and out of reality. Their connection to the mall was severing, I said. Keep it up, Luke. Daniel tried propping himself up against the flickering copper doors. You can't stop him, he said. Not really. He's a god. He's ancient. Immortal. That's great, Jorge said. I just don't want him in my mall. You and your ugly ill god can screw back off to the bottom of the South China Sea. Daniel quickly grabbed one of the door handles and smiled. Gladly, he said. The door only opened a crack, but it was enough for him to slip through. But as he did, Luke lunged at him and chopped one of his hands off before the door closed. Daniel screamed in pain, but the door shut and flickered out, disappearing from the mall. All of the statues in the corridor were in partially melted piles. The fountain water was no longer swirling eels. The other statues, Luke said and all the other corridors. We need to take care of them, too. How the heck are we going to explain all of this to Jenkins in the morning? Jorge asked. I looked down at Daniel's severed hand. I got a plan, I said. The next morning, we showed Jenkins a new prank video uploaded on Daniel's YouTube page. One of a hooded Jedi figure running around the mall slicing through all of Jenkins' beloved statues. We used Jorge's knockoff GoPros to film it all, and Daniel's severed hand to unlock the phone in his duffel bag in order to gain access to his YouTube account. Gross, I know, but it worked. Jorge and I were fired. We failed to protect them all from YouTubers, which was our primary mission. I was okay with this development, but Jorge took it pretty hard at first. We all helped Luke and Susan set up their new stores. The mall feels less creepy now. It's still dying and probably won't have any business five years from now. But I think whatever presence was here is now gone. Jenna and I are officially a thing now. And Jorge and I, inspired by all of our friends who are now entrepreneurs, are starting our own business. We're going to be offering security services. On the side, we might tackle strange occurrences that other security companies can't handle. Or if people have problems with YouTubers, we can deal with them too. If we encounter anything weird, I'll let you guys know. Hey everyone, thank you for taking the time to listen to today's video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you have your own personal scary story or experience, be sure to submit them to my website at southerncannibal.com. Stay safe, everyone, and remember to always stay hungry.